Well, good morning. It's, ten, it's at 9.30 and it's about time for us to begin. And this morning we have a, a guest speaker, Dr. G.K. Beal, who has been here before. Back in October, he uh, gave us a lesson on Isaiah chapter 6. But for some of you who were not here or some of you who are visiting, uh, let me give a few words by way of introduction. Dr. Beal is a native of Dallas. He went to Hillcrest High School, was a star football player there. If you don't believe me, ask him. <laughs> I actually played against him, and he, he beat us. Uh, he went on to SMU and then to Dallas Theological Seminary. We were students together there, became good friends. And while he was there, I should add, getting his uh, Master of Theology, he was getting his Master of History at uh, SMU, which was quite an accomplishment. And then he went on to the University of Cambridge where he got his PhD, and I think he also studied at Tübingen in Germany. So Dr. Beale is quite qualified. He taught at Grove City College, Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, Wheaton College, and Westminster Theological Seminary. And he is presently teaching here in Dallas at uh, Reformed Theological Seminary. Dr. Beale is a scholar. He is a prolific writer. And among his books are a handbook handbook on the New Testament use of the Old Testament, which was a favorite subject of uh, both of our mentor, Dr. S. Lewis Johnson. And he wrote an important commentary on the book of Revelation. And I think that's a good place to stop the introduction and then give Dr. Beale his opportunity to teach because he is going to teach on passage out of the book of Revelation. So I'm I'll let Dr. Beal uh, open us in prayer. Greg, it's good to have you. Thank you. Well, let's ask God's blessing on this word today. Father, we ask that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to understand your word today. May we leave knowing you better and... Uh, experiencing your presence more intensely and being able to honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. When our family was in Maine many years ago, I was uh, uh, teaching, preaching for someone who was on a vacation for a few weeks, and so we moved and lived in the manse, uh, way up in Maine, way up in down east Maine. And, and we uh, went to a little town and um, I visited a bed and breakfast. They had an antique shop there, and uh, it was very interesting. And I got a brochure. They had a brochure advertising the bed and breakfast. I, I took it, and later I was looking at it, and it said, uh, you know, come to our bed and breakfast. We have beautiful lawns. Well, I had been there, and they had two little patches of, uh, I wouldn't call it a lawn. It would take about three minutes to mow. Um, and, and then it says, beautiful views of the bay. Well, they had the, the, these old buildings that blocked the view of the bay. What you could see was just an old fishing boat that had uh, been wrecked and was just left there and was rotting. And said, and we have a very quaint tea shop. Well, it was a kitchen with just a little table and some chairs. So to say the least, this brochure gave a false impression of the bed and breakfast. Uh, sort of like a purported antique tapestry that I heard about uh, by uh, a Paris weaver that was sold. Uh, he sold it for a record price, but then someone who was helping him kind of spilled the beans on what was happening. And uh, what happened was they used special threads, and, and, and when they wove this thing together, they dragged it behind a car to get it to look worn, and then they uh, smoked it to give it kind of a uh, I don't know, you know, an old uh, smell. And uh, they deftly ingrained some dust from some old crumbling uh, rafters of, of an old uh, uh, church. 
and um, they faded it by ultraviolet rays. Uh, so it was a pretty good fake, but it turned out, yes, it was a fake. And we've really developed the fake pretty well in our culture. I mean, how many of us have gone through a house, uh, someone else's house, you see a bowl of fruit, or you see a, a green plant or some flowers? I don't know about you, but I just have a temptation to want to touch it. Is this really real or not? Have you ever had that temptation? I have. And, but the, the fakes have been developed so amazingly in our culture. And unfortunately, it's no different, more soberly, in the world of Christianity. There are a lot of religious fakes passing themselves off as Christian leaders, people who seem to be real Christians, but then something is, uh, uh, news comes out that they have been characteristically involved in grave sin for many, many years, to such an extent one wonders, are these people really believers? And if they are, they certainly should have no assurance that they know the Lord. Now the church at Laodicea, in our passage here in chapter 3 of Revelation, verses 14 to 22, had a problem of not perceiving the dangers of their spiritual environment and of not being able to assess rightly their own spiritual health. And in fact, they're on the verge of being declared a pseudo-church, a fake church. Now our passage, if we look at it, it's divided into four sections. There's verse 14, which is the self-presentation of Christ, and to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this. And then the second part, or verses 15 to 16, which is Christ's accusation of their ineffective faith. Notice verse 15, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And verse 17 gives Christ's accusation of their blind self-sufficiency. Verse 17, because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and you have need of nothing, you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And then the final section, the fourth section of verses 18 to 22, which is the solution, the remedy to overcome their sin and the resulting reward. Verse 18 and following. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become rich, and white garments that you may clothe yourself, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and I solve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline. Be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and eat with me. He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. That's the reward. And finally, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now notice first how Christ introduces himself. Look again at verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this. Now, I've given you a handout, um, and I'd like you to look at it. It has... Uh, Two, two boxes on it. You'll notice on the right hand top, it says the Amen, faithful and true witness. What Jesus is doing here is actually interpreting what has been said in chapter 1 and verse 5, where it says he's the faithful witness. Well, what is a faithful witness? He expands on that. It means he's the Amen. He's dependable. He is not only faithful, but he's true. And then notice also what follows faithful witness in Revelation 1.5 is the firstborn from the dead. And notice what follows in Revelation 3.14, the beginning of the creation of God. Now some think that uh, this is referring to the first creation, and even that Jesus is a part, the beginning part of that first creation. Jehovah's Witnesses uh, probably would affirm that. And being a part of the creation, he is not equal in full deity to the Father. But I don't think this is referring to the first creation because it is developing that statement in chapter 1 and verse 5, firstborn from the dead. What's firstborn from the dead? He's the beginning of the creation, the beginning of the new creation. And uh, that that is the case uh, is evident from the bottom box. You notice in the bottom box, again, we have the statement in Revelation 3.14, Christ is the Amen, the faithful and true witness. 
Isaiah 65, 16 says, the God of Amen, the God of Amen, describing the God uh, uh, of, the, of the Old Testament, the God of Israel. There's only one place in all of the Bible where someone is addressed as the Amen, and that's God in Isaiah 65, 16. And for Jesus to call himself the Amen is a pretty amazing statement. He is identifying himself with Yahweh, with God of Isaiah. And he's expanding what Amen means. He is the faithful and true witness. In fact, if you'll notice uh, in that uh, left column in the middle, early Greek Bibles, it translated this verse in Isaiah 65, 16. Some have Amen, some have true, some have faithful. So um, G Jesus is explaining this passage in the same way that uh, it had been translated already. But notice now what follows Isaiah 65, 16 in the left bottom column. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. He's going to bring about a new creation. And you can depend on it because he's the God of Amen. And I think that the statement in Revelation that follows Amen, faithful and true witness, also, the beginning of the new creation of God. This is the new creation. This is the beginning fulfillment of Isaiah 65, 17. It's amazing. Christ's resurrection is the beginning. Because remember, the uh, beginning of the creation is an interpretation of firstborn from the dead in Revelation 1, 5. So Christ's resurrection is the beginning of the new creation. He's not like a new creation. He's really the beginning, literally of the new creation. Same thing is taught in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 17, where it says basically that Christ died and we died. He rose and we've been resurrected. And then one effect of that is verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now those believers that Paul's talking about, which include us if we're believers, they're not like a new creation. Well, they are, but they're like a new creation because they are the beginning of a new creation. When we're spiritually raised with Christ, we begin in Him, in union with Him, to be part of that fulfillment of Isaiah 65. Now, that verse in Isaiah 65, Because every self-presentation in the book of Revelation 
And each one of those was a representation of Christ. And each one's different. And the reason they're different is because they are aptly suited to the problem in each church. For example, you remember the Christ is the one who walked with them on the golden landscape. And then verse 5 it says, if you don't repent, then I'm going to remove your lampstand. If you're not a shining witness, a light to the world, that's the church, that I'm going to remove you. So Greg, that he walks. Your, your microphone went out. So we're switching you out. Okay. We got it? Yeah, it's good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. You hurt my momentum there. <laughs> so the fact that he presents himself as the one walking among, among the lampstands is very relevant to the problem of Ephesus, isn't it? Because they're not shining as a lampstand. The fact that Jesus represents himself as a faithful witness means likely they've got a problem with witness. And we'll see that as we go along. I think they did not stand out as Christians because they identified in some way with the idols of the various trades. Uh, Laodicea, uh, among all of the seven churches, was uh, at a very important economic crossroad. And there were many trades. They had a woolen industry, a banking industry, uh, other industries. Every trade had a patron deity or goddess. And if you wanted to be a part of that trade and continue to practice your trade, well, you had to go to a meal uh, that's in, in a temple where the, uh, a statue of that god or goddess was. And there was also a bust of Caesar there, so you'd give allegiance to Caesar. And you would eat a meal dedicated to the god who had prospered your trade. Now, if you didn't do that, you'd be ostracized and essentially lose your job. I remember in college here in Dallas to make some money in the summer, I worked for some trucking company, and um, they told me pretty quickly, hey, uh, you, you gotta pay your dues to the, uh, to the union. Um, I mean, it's possible, you, you don't have to pay the dues, but it'll be good for you if you do. And so I paid the dues. And it's something like that in the ancient world, though uh, perhaps more severe. Um, so. Their, their ineffectiveness as witnesses for Christ is driven home, I think, by these two verses. Let's read them again. Verse 15, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you. Actually, vomit is the word here. I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, many people take this. Uh, lukewarmness is a half-hearted commitment. And Christ is saying, look, I can't stand half-hearted Christians. Either be hot on fire for me or be cold. But what that means is Christ is really saying, uh, hey, if you're not hot, I want you to be cold completely. That would be very strange to have Christ saying and desiring that we be cold. I don't think the traditional view of lukewarmness is half-hearted commitment is really what's going on here. The picture of hot, cold, and lukewarm water was a unique feature of the territory around Laodicea. They were near Hierapolis, which had hot water, and even still today is a spa. Uh, and also nearby Colossae had very cold water. Both really had a great health-giving effect. However, even though Laodicea was at a really good economic crossroad, they were far from good water. They had to pipe it in. And by the time it got to them, sometimes it was impure, sometimes lukewarm. And even beyond thinking of that, in the ancient world, hot water had a healthful effect. Cold water had a healthful effect. Lukewarm water was not much good for anything. And so the effect of their conduct on Christ was like the effect of their own water. He wanted to vomit them out. Because the effect of their witness was not helpful. 
They, they, they were not having a helpful effect on their society. Have you ever reached for a, a, a glass of milk after pouring it? Uh, maybe it's cold, you're out on the patio, you get a call, and 20 minutes later you come back, take a gulp, and ugh, it's, it's kind of lukewarm. Not, not very good. So I, I think that their witness was ineffective on the outside world because of their compromise with the trade unions. They'd lose their jobs. And so they were attending these trade unions. How effective would their witness be? If they said, Christ is the only way, he's your only security. And they say, well, why are you going to the trade unions? And uh, of course, maybe they rationalized and said, well, when they pray to the goddess, I'll just pray to Jesus. But they're still there. And uh, it looks like they're worshiping. So they were not having a healthful effect on those around them, a healthful spiritual effect. Now, ineffective witness, I think, was not their only problem. They had another problem and a greater problem, and it was actually the problem that caused their ineffective witness. And what was that? Verse 17 tells us. Let's look at it. Because you say, I am rich, and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now look at that first phrase. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, have need of nothing. That is a direct allusion to Hosea, chapter 12 and verse 8. But we don't need to turn there. You can if you want. But it says, Ephraim, which is part of Israel, Ephraim said, surely I become rich. I found wealth for myself. In all my labors they will find in me no iniquity, which would be sin. The wording is so close, definitely. He's alluding there. And even, in fact, in verse 7, it says, Israel is a merchant. And when Israel's pictured as a merchant elsewhere in Hosea, they're depending on idols. Their economy was based on their trust in idols. They were saying, well, we can trust in God, but also Baal as well. We can trust in Baal to give us fertility of children, of crops, of animals, and so on. God, through Hosea, also accuses uh, Israel of being worthless. Later on in verse 11 of chapter 12. Likewise, the Laodicean Christians believed they were in a healthy spiritual condition. Nothing's new. They're just repeating the sin of Israel again. Thinking that their, their economic prosperity could uh, be a sign of their spiritual health. Like Israel in the Old Testament, they thought that some forms of idol worship really weren't inconsistent with uh, worship of God. They rationalized. They were doing well economically because of willing cooperation with the trade guilds. This involvement is clear because when John uses this word rich, look again at verse uh, 17, because you say, I am rich. When he uses that word rich elsewhere in the book of Revelation, interestingly, it refers to unbelievers who are completely plugged in to the ungodly Babylonian worldly economic and religious system. For example, chapter 18 says this, beginning at verse 2. An angel cries out with a mighty voice saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She's become a dwelling place of demons, a prison of every unclean spirit, and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her. And the merchants, including the merchants of Laodicea, the merchants of the earth have become rich. There's the word. Yeah, same word in Greek. They've become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. So they had uh, spiritual intercourse with the whore of Babylon the Great, basically trusting in her for their ultimate economic welfare. Their witness became ineffective when they paid allegiance to other pagan gods. Again, maybe they did witness some, but it would have been totally diluted by their showing up at the trade guild temples and eating meals offered to gods who purportedly had prospered that particular trade. 
Their healthy assessment of their own condition cannot have been more wrong. Notice the last part of verse 17. Christ says, and, but really we ought to say, but, but, you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. They were spiritually the opposite of what they thought. They need to be shocked into the reality of their faith if they are true believers or shocked into it for the first time. And this is why he says at the end, look at verse 22, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. They need to be shocked by God's Spirit. Their wealth made them feel like they had no needs. And when you don't have any physical needs, sometimes it's easy not to trust Christ for anything. And when you begin not to trust Christ, you begin to do what? To become self-sufficient and trust yourself. And the further out of touch we get with Christ, with Christ, the further out of touch we are with spiritual reality. We become spiritually insensitive and dull and can think, we, hey, we're healthy. But in reality, we're not. In fact, the self-sufficiency become, can become self-worship. We become our own idol. Or some part of the world, like uh, uh, physical welfare, becomes uh, our idol. So they couldn't perceive their spiritual reality. They couldn't perceive the spiritual rottenness that was happening with them. Have you ever gotten out a scrapbook? I'm speaking to some of, of, of the older people in the audience here. And you look at your high school pictures, maybe college, and you say, wow, I sure had a lot of hair back then. <laughs> or I was thin back then. Or, I wasn't really that bad looking back then. How did I get like this? When did it happen? Well, you look in the mirror every day. You don't notice the change. It happens so, so slowly. And really the Laodiceans, and we as Christians, sometimes we don't notice the change that's happening in us spiritually. And we need to be shocked back into the reality of our faith to see that change by Christ's word because he is giving them his word right here. Well, what's the solution to their problem? How can they begin to evaluate their spiritual condition for what it is and not become self-sufficient? Verses 18 to 22 give us the remedy to how they can overcome this self-sufficiency. And we'll start with verse 18. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become rich and white garments that you may clothe yourself that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and I sell to anoint your eyes that you may see. The point here is the remedy for self-sufficiency and spiritual dullness is to renew our relationship with Christ. Let me repeat that. The remedy for self-sufficiency and spiritual dullness is to renew our relationship with Christ. And how does that happen? By his word, which he's speaking to them, and by identifying with him as a witness, the faithful witness. Continually renewing our relationship with Christ is the only thing which can revive us, bring us out from under the spiritual anesthesia. They're to renew their relationship with Christ by identifying with him, his word, his witness, and not the world. That's why he introduces himself as the faithful witness. It's not there for nothing, remember? The way he introduces himself is always integrally related to the problem of each letter. Now each of the three images of verse 18 corresponds to something in verse 17. Notice uh, verse 18 says, buy gold uh, from me refined by fire. Well the end of verse 17 says that they are poor. That, that solves that problem. And then we have the statement, buy white garments that you may clothe yourself. And you'll notice it's in the verse 17 says they were naked. In fact, uncovering the shame of nakedness, notice buy white garments that you may clothe yourself, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. That phrase, uncovering the shame of nakedness, is a phrase used by God in the Old Testament when he accuses Israel and other nations of idol worship. Because, figuratively speaking, he says, I'm going to show you that you're a whore. I'm going to raise up your, your skirts. Because they have been committing spiritual intercourse with idols. 
And so this shows that they are involved in idolatry, just as Israel was. Why? For economic security. Again, they need ears to hear. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. They'd become anesthetized, complacent in their bliss. It should be remembered that behind the idols lurk demons. So this is pretty serious. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says, What do I mean then, that a thing sacrificed to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God, and I do not want you to become sharers in demons. And that statement by Paul itself is from Deuteronomy 32, 17. So their, part of their anesthesia is not just from their own sin, but from the malevolent forces of evil behind the demons, which do exist. We often don't think they do, but they do. We need to have eyes to see and ears to hear when the powers of evil are lurking around us. So they need to be shocked into the reality of their faith and the satanic realities that are around them. They were anesthetized. I had a friend who was a doctor, and, and one day walked, walked, there, uh, walked into his office a, a diabetic patient. He sat down, and, and, and my friend uh, said, well, tell me what's wrong. He said, I'm smelling something, and I can't figure it out for the life of me. So he said, okay, get up on the table. So my doctor friend checks him over everywhere. Can't find anything. Head to toe, but when he gets to the toe and looks at one of his feet, there is a hole that's an abscess. It's a huge infection that really is terrible. And this fellow was older. He couldn't bend down and, and, and look at his feet. He couldn't feel it because the diabetes had caused uh, his feet to become numb, as sometimes happens with uh, diabetic patients. The Laodiceans were somewhat like that. They had a rotting spiritual abscess that they were not recognizing. And they needed to recognize it. And so the solution to it is Christ saying, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become rich. White garments you may clothe yourself that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and I sell to anoint your eyes that you may see. That you may see the spiritual realities around you the way that I do. Now, it cannot be coincidence that if you study much about Laodicea, they were known for three things. They were known for their amazing woolen industry, which may be pictured here by the clothing. They were also known for their amazing banking industry, which is probably pictured here by the gold. And they were known, this is very interesting, for a school of ophthalmology nearby, and someone had uh, created an, an eye salve that had become very well known, and people flocked there if they had eye problems. That, that cannot be accidental. And so Christ basically is conducting a polemic. In those areas they trusted most, perhaps. He said, now you trust in me for the spiritual riches, for the spiritual clothing, for the spiritual eyesight. These were the institutions in which many Christians then were participating and trusting. And since they had no material needs, they felt no need to depend on Christ for anything. And when that happens, you begin to get out of touch with spiritual reality, become self-sufficient, become spiritually dull and insensitive. And then you can't evaluate your own condition, much less the condition of others. They could not resort to the resources of ungodly society to solve their problem. They couldn't resort to their own inherent resources. Only Christ's spiritual resources can help them. Now, it's interesting that Christ's uh, resources are mentioned. Um, the three products here, the gold, the clothing, and the eye salve. Uh, notice when Christ presents himself, Initially, in that opening vision in chapter 1, I want you to look there. Chapter 1 and verse 14, he's the Son of Man. The three spiritual products that Christ is talking about here. 
the spiritual gold, the spiritual clothing, the spiritual eyesight are all his attributes. He's saying, buy into me. Identify with me and my faithful witness. Notice verse 14, uh, verse 13. In the middle of the lamp stands, one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet. He has the clothing there. Furthermore, and girded across his breast with a, what kind of girdle? A golden girdle. He has the gold. And his head and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow. Three emphases on white. White, white, like snow. And he had said in our passage, chapter 3, buy white garments from me. Even his hair being wool in some way may be a kind of a polemical allusion to the woolen industry. He possesses the true clothing, in other words. Don't trust in the material woolen industry for your ultimate security. And then look at the end of verse 14. His eyes were like a flame of fire. He has piercing eyesight. True insight. So much so that in chapter 2 and verse 23, he can say, I am the one who searches the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. I remember again, um, we have a lot of stories from Maine. Um, we, we've gone up there about 16 summers now. Uh, we have a little lobster shack up there. And, um, but when we went the first time, we were on Beals Island. It's not named after me. Um, but on that island, there is a, um, a conservation area. And they have paths. And so we took the kids through. Kids were small. We took them through. And it was really enjoyable. And, uh, but we were walking pretty fast. And I uh, thought, well, no big deal. And then we met a guy coming the other way. And he said he was a botanist. He was out looking at the flowers and the plants. And he began to tell us about the flowers. One of them, he said, there's an insect uh, um, eating plant that opens, gets the insects, closes back up. Told us about some other plants and flowers. And he said, hey, did you know what that is over there? We said, no. He said, that is a bog. It's one of the biggest, in, uh, apparently, uh, in Maine. And so after he left, we continued to walk along the trail. But... Uh, we had better eyes to see, to appreciate what was going on along the trail there. And so also with Christ, he gives us insight to better see as we're walking the trail of the Christian life, to better see the dangers around us, to better see when we're beginning to sin ourselves, to better see what are the riches of Christ. So let me ask again how Christ's self-presentation uh, about being the faithful witness uh, and the beginning of the new creation is related to the problem of the Laodicean Christians. They need to be renewed in their relationship with Christ. And His new creational power will be able to help them on that. Note that Christ presents Himself as a resurrected new creation. I mean, He's, he's the resurrected Lord. Uh, in, in chapter 3 and verse 14. He's speaking as a resurrected Lord and as the new creation, remember? He presents himself as uh, that power, the only power that can arouse them from their anesthetized stupor. They need to go to God's Word, which is part of what Jesus is addressing them with. And Discover who he is, identify with him, either for the first time or re-identify with him as the resurrected Lord so that the Spirit can arouse them from the dead, from their stupor. Remember, the Spirit works by the Word. Jesus identifies himself as God. Remember the Amen from Isaiah? Why is that important? Because they're hooked into idols. They're worshiping other gods. He's the only God. He wants them to know that the Laodiceans and us are to identify ourselves with the resurrected Jesus. We're to be a witness. You know, I've been praying lately. Uh, the Lord, bring unbelievers across my path. And um, he hadn't done it yet, but I've been praying. Bring unbelievers across my path, Lord. 
I think it's a good prayer. We need to become zealous, and that's just what he says in verse 19 of chapter 3. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So they need to be renewed in their relationship with Christ. They need an injection of new spiritual vitality of the new creation, which is the only place from which power comes to overcome sin. Now notice uh, how they are to be renewed. One way is by His love for them. Look at verse 19. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. When we know someone really loves us, it endears us to them. Christ loves us. Now, that verse itself, again, uh, almost every verse in the book of Revelation has some connection to the Old Testament, in my opinion. This verse actually is an allusion to Proverbs 3, 11 to 12, which says that God is our Father and He instructs and disciplines us. Hebrews 12 quotes the same proverb and says, if you claim to be a son, but you are without discipline, you're an illegitimate son. We need to come to the... How how are we disciplined? We come to the Scriptures. And the Scriptures discipline us if we're in sin. If we're in other situations needing encouragement, the Scriptures encourage us. As some say, uh, the Scriptures... uh, afflict us if we're in sin, and they uh, affirm us, they encourage us if we need encouragement. Um, this, this love is also expressed in verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. This is an allusion to the Song of Solomon. I just want to read it for you. The bride and husband have been married, recently married. And now, in verse 2 of chapter 5, the bride says, I was asleep, but my heart was awake. A voice, my beloved, was knocking. Open to me, sister, my darling, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is drenched with dew, my locks with the damp of the night. She says, I've taken off my dress. I'm too tired. How can I put it on again? I washed my feet. How can I dirty them again? And then it says, the wife says, My beloved extended his hand through the opening, and my feelings were aroused for him. He was showing his love. My feelings were aroused for him. I arose to open to my beloved. And it says, verse 6, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had gone. My heart went out. I searched for him. And so likewise, here in chapter 3 and verse 20, we have the same Uh, uh, wording that's unique with Song of Solomon, the door, the knocking, the voice, the opening. And Christ is saying, I am the bridegroom. I'm the husband. You're the bride. And open the door to me. By the way, this is not a reference uh, to unbelievers. This is addressed to a church who are claiming to be believers. And so it's an encouragement to remind themselves that Christ loves them. And that love, just as with Solomon and his wife, that love will cause the bride, the church, to want to search for him and to find him if we've lost our way. So The main point of our passage actually now comes in verse 21. If we overcome, if we overcome this spiritual anesthesia, this idolatry, this conformity to the world, if we overcome it, what happens? I will give it to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. In other words, if we identify with Christ, in witness especially, if we identify with Christ... He will identify with us at the end time judgment. If we don't identify with Him, He won't identify with us. And we will be judged. So Christ as the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, ruler of the kings of the earth. That's the end of verse 5. 
And that's what verse 21 is developing, this idea of kingship. Christians who are faithful witnesses are also born from the dead and will reign with Christ. So the main idea of our passage is this. We overcome self-sufficiency and spiritual dullness by renewing our relationship with Christ. We overcome self-sufficiency and spiritual dullness by renewing our relationship with Christ. How? By His Word and identifying with Him as a witness. In what ways can you and I be a witness in this culture? Our relationships with friends or with our mates are rejuvenated only by continual conversation and being in the presence of one another. It's the same with our relationship with Christ. We above all people in the West are so well off materially that we will not sense our need of Christ if we're not continually renewing our relationship with Him in His Word and in prayer and being aware of being witnesses. We'll be kept aware of all the many ways that we are to depend on Him and of how He loves us and how this should motivate the genuine believer to identify with Him in witness if we stay in His Word. The anesthesia of affluence, is what we might call this, can put us to sleep about our sin and need to trust in Christ. We need to continually renew our relationship with Him to keep from being anesthetized. So we overcome self-sufficiency and spiritual dullness by continually renewing our relationship with Christ. How? By His Word and witness. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. Lord, I pray that You would give us eyes to see and ears to hear when we begin to suffer spiritual deterioration. And that when it happens, we would come to You and to Your Word and realize You are the only one who has the resources to make us healthy. We thank You that You have all the riches we need. You have all the clothing of righteousness that we need. You have all the spiritual eyesight that we need. Give us that, Lord, I pray. In Christ's name, amen.